Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Rocket Lab recently showed off plans for their next rocket, Neutron. Neutron is a medium lift, methalox powered carbon composite rocket with a propulsively landing reusable first stage that features a super cool integrated payload fairing. Now their announcement video was amazing, but I still had a lot of uh, nerdy questions that I couldn't wait to get the answers to. So join me as I chat with their founder, CEO, and CTO, Peter Beck. Peter Beck, how you doing? Good, thanks, Tim. Uh, huge congratulations on the awesome Neutron announcement that looks uh, looks amazing. Honestly, I have to say right up front, I'm really excited about this rocket. How are you feeling about it after all the feedback and everything? You you pretty excited to get going on it? Yeah, well, I mean, look, um, you know, it's 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 taking a tremendous amount of learnings over many many years and uh, hard lessons and 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 hard won lessons and and you know, transferring that into something that we think is is going to be pretty pretty important for the future. Yeah, um, it definitely looks like it's going to be a, a good competitor in that class. I mean, eight tons to orbit, that's a pretty nice sweet spot. Um, you even talked about maybe the, you're open to the option of expending it at, at for 15 or 16 tons to orbit, is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, we it, it would be a be a sad day to to watch a reusable rocket get expended, but um, but you know, there's, there'll be some missions I'm sure that that um, that'll warrant. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, it will have a life. So um, you know, you may as well run the end of life missions as expendable. That's that's absolutely true, and that that's interesting to think looking that far forward. You know that yeah, it's at some point the fleet of vehicles, you know, they'll get old and retire, and you can send them off in a proper. You know, uh, that's a, that's a proper send off. I feel like you know. It is. A, yeah. Yeah. So you guys have, have had a lot of really interesting and unique design decisions in this vehicle. Stuff that mm. you know I don't think I've ever seen before, which is which is always exciting. So uh, I want to go to a couple of them. First off, I think one of the, the things that most people are talking about that's that's really exciting is uh, I love the four pedal. You know, the opening uh, design of your fairing and how it stays attached to the first stage. Uh, that is is super cool. What um, what's like? What is do you? How far are you along in the design of knowing like how to actually open that and close that? Is that you know what what types of systems are you looking for in, in that? Yeah. So I mean, we're th there's still a little bit of a trade going on between four pedals and two pedals um, at at the moment. So we hope to have that closed by the end of this year. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, the, the fundamental you know ethos around that is is. Um, not having to go and pick them up or not having to deal with them in any other way. I mean, the best the best solution for you know reusing fairings is to just hold them on um, <laughs> and and you know and, and keep them. So uh, so that, that that really was there's a, a bunch of really fundamental decisions that that drove a whole lot of things with the vehicle. And um, you know we sat down right at the beginning. We said, look, um, the vehicle must be able to be tw you know turned around in 24 hours. And although you know I don't anticipate ever turning the vehicle around in 24 hours, just that constraint, um, you know, created a whole lot of you know a whole lot of design decisions that, that needed to be needed to be resolved and, and made. And what you see is is basically um, you know the result of of some of those really difficult constraints. And the fairing's been one of them because you can't turn a vehicle around in 24 hours if you've got to you know put new fairings on or go and collect new fairings out in the middle of the ocean. So. Um, you know, a whole bunch of things really came down to that 24 hour turnaround. Yeah. And that totally, I, I love the idea of it staying with the first stage. That makes so much sense, but it brings up that, I guess that makes me think, you know, why, I guess, why is it not more common to have fairings be ditched even at stage separation anyway, you know, with, with most boosters and vehicles, I, I kind of, I, <clears throat> I guess maybe falsely assumed that we're still slightly too low in the atmosphere. There's still a, correct. Uh, a, a dynamic. Yeah, yeah, there's still some dynamic pressure heating is yeah. too high. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. does that mean you're gonna have to do a little bit, you know, higher altitude separation and things like that, or what's that? How's that actually yeah, look, change that? Yeah, well, I mean, as you know, like a launch vehicle is just one giant engineering compromise, and mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's and it's and it's really about um, enabling you to, to to be able to compromise in certain areas, and that's where materials played such a massive, uh, important role for us because. Uh, if you can remove so much mass out of the structures, then all of a sudden, you know, you've got more scope to to do things like coast for a little bit longer and and you know deal with that dynamic pressure and that heating a little bit later, um, and you can add more structures also to deal with that as well. So um, so so yeah, there's it it all comes down to mass at the end of the day. It's is the the biggest challenge you need to solve. Yeah, and so that brings up the the beautiful uh, upper stage concept of being of being hung by the basically by the payload separator. 
Yeah. Right. So it's yep. so it's under tension, under acceleration of the first stage, uh, which allows you to not have to worry about compression. But then that brings up the question of how, you know, it will it will be under compression during acceleration of the second stage anyway. Is that just such a low powered second stage? It will never quite, you know, reach one, two, three G's. Or how does that work then? Well, I mean, so the tanks are always pressurized to give you your, you know, enough MPSH on the inlet suction sides of your pump. So, you know, the dominant load case in an upper stage um, is, is is that pressurized um, load case. So, you know, when the tanks are pressurized, the thrust that that's reacting into that structure um, is is well less than the pressure that's that's you know those tanks are pressurized to. So, um, you know, think of it like sitting on a balloon. If the balloon's pumped up enough, then you know it, it, it's 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 no big deal. But um, you know the, the this it's really re- really important um, element that that upper stage because as we were going through the design we, we really started trading a reusable upper stage and it's a really it's a really tough trade um, and you know never say never but for us where it made the most amount of sense is if if you look at the relative sizes of the first stage and the second stage the second stage is tiny. Um, but yet the second stage is doing, you know, as with most rockets, um, the first stage is just getting you through the soup. The second mm-hmm. stage is, is doing a lot of work. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, the reason why the second stage is so tiny is because it's just so ridiculously light. Um, you know, think of like, like Centaur is a, is, a, is a good example of this, right? Centaur is kind of a hung stage as well. Um, and it's in thin, thin stainless steel. Mm-hmm. So imagine a Centaur, but make that out of carbon fiber, which is one quarter of the mass of the stainless steel. And you know wow. you end up with an upper stage, which is super high performance, um, which is you know what what you really want in an upper stage. But the other advantage for that is that there's no material in it either, so it's super cheap. Um, it's not mm. like there's you know a large mass of carbon composite you know material, and it. it's it's very very inexpensive to produce. And then when we use the automated um, automated um, you know tape laying or fiber placement. It's, it's, it's just almost unfair because, you know, you can lay a tank down and we, we measure it on, you know, how many metres a minute of, of tank are we producing, not, you know, not, not how many, you know, metres an hour or metres a day. It's like <laughs> metres a minute. Wow. So, you know, you can produce this at a very low cost, very high performance structures. And, you know, the dominant load case in a launch vehicle is, you know, you've, you've obviously you've got your, you know, your, your, your tanks that are pressurised and that's, that's a very dominant load case. But actually, on a, on especially on a large launch vehicle, the, the, the thing that you battle most most with is is buckling. So if you look at a if you look at like uh, a lot of launch vehicles, either they've got their ISO grid or they've got lots and lots of stringers on the back of the thin um, thin panels, mm-hmm. uh, and and that that's really the you know the thing that you're battling with all, all the time is is these buckling loads. So <coughs> with 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 carbon, um, you have so much stiffness. Um, and, a, and a much thicker wall thickness for you know a relative mass that um, you can deal with these buckling cases without having to put internal structure in behind it, um, and oh. that once again it just simplifies simplifies things. If you have a look at it, you know lots of launch vehicles, you'll see just a sea of kind of either welds or internal structures you know up the side of it um, to deal with that that buckling load case. That brings up a good point. Yeah, I guess I'd. Never considered that, but you're right. I mean, looking at you know shots, the, the ISO grids of, of most vehicles makes it look so complex on the inside of the the fuselage, you know, inside of the tanks. Um, but you know, there's also always going to be like bafflings and and th- things of that mm. nature, of course, too. But um, but yeah, I guess I had never I never considered that. But uh, back to the second stage, is that still running? Is that also running on methane as well? Correct. Yep. Yep. And so basically, the same engine on the first stage is is the as, as on the second stage is the first, but um, of vacuum optimized. Vacuum of optimized. Wow. That so that'll be a pretty powerful second stage too. I mean, it's just physically powerful. That's that might be almost an overpowered second stage similar yeah. to the Merlin. <clears throat> Yeah, no, you no, you did right about that. We're we're we continually. Um, it's kind of a nice a nice problem because the problem feeds also directly into the landing burn engine as well. They, those kind of upper stage and landing burn engine has similar thrust and throttle requirements. So that's at least a nice thing. Mm. Um, but the challenge is, yes, um, you know, especially near the end of burn, that 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 uh, that upper stage engine throttled right back. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine because because you're looking at a. You know, a one in one mega newton engine. You know, that's 
That, mm. That's up there. That's that's you know sounds like a very familiar class, uh, you know, compared to Merlin and things like that too. Um, why did you mm. guys end up? Uh, I'm curious with a clean slate design. You know, you ended up at methane, and it seems like you know years passed. We had yeah, never yeah, touched yeah, methane, yeah. and now everyone's doing methane. Yeah, I know. Why is Rocket Lab doing methane? What were the design <coughs> decisions there? Yeah, no, that that that's that that's a good question. So, really, it, what it came down to is reusability. Um, ultimately, uh, you you know you because the the composite structures are super light, you don't pay at all really for the extra or the, the the reduction in density and the increase in tankage. It's it's a very good trade versus ISP. So that's a great trade. But ultimately, what it came down to was reusability. And if you think about, um, you know, Lox Kero is, is, is a great combination, but one of the challenges with that is, is coking and sooting. So, you know, through the regen channels and especially through the, you know, the pre-burners and, and bits and pieces in, in the turbo machinery, it's just, it's just a heck of a job to de-scunge that every, you know, every flight. So once again, you know, it came down to the, the 24-hour theorem, like you're not going to de-scunge all these engines um, in, in 24 hours. Whereas if you look at a methane engine, especially in a GG cycle, um, you know you could eat your lunch um, out of the GG, um, you know, pre burner after you, you know after you, after you've, you've, you've run an engine. So ultimately, that's that's what drove the decision into methane. Um, nothing else. It was purely how do we how do we re, we actually get reusability in these engines um, and reliably and and just not have that coking issue. Well, but also as far as cost of operation, methane is a relatively cheap fuel too, though. So that's not a bad compared to RP1, correct? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yes and no. I mean, um, it, it's one of these things that are like hidden costs. Yeah, you know, per pound it's cheap fuel, but actually, by the time you have all the infrastructure mm. required to to deal with it and yeah. and contain it and, and flare it and all the rest of it, actually, it's like everything in this in in the rocket industry, in the launch vehicle industry. It's it's you know that that's where the real cost lies. Um, mm. You know, if I if I drew you a graph of what it costs to launch an electron. Um, you know, the, the only like a relatively small fraction of it is the cost of the materials, uh, like the bill of materials. It's much, much more expensive, you know, to fly a vehicle than um, than, than actually, you know, to build one. When yeah. when you when you amortise everything over all of the launch infrastructure and everything like that, that's why if you look at neutron, there is no strong back. Um, that's just deleted. Um, mm. And if you look at a, a you know the the pad, it's a very very simple clean pad. That's mm-hmm. because all of that infrastructure adds really significant cost um, to uh, to operating a launch vehicle, and that was the reason why it's a return to launch site. Um, you yeah. have any idea what it costs to operate a ship? <laughs> like, I mean, it's yeah. way way cheaper for us to use a heli to fly out for an electron to fly out with a helicopter than it is to put a ship out there for a couple of days. It's just ridiculous. Marine assets huh. are so expensive. Huh. So um, you know. You know, if if you if you land on a barge, then you know you have to operate that marine fleet, and that becomes very very expensive. So, return to launch site once again just lets delete out that element. So it's actually that the operational costs of flying a rocket is what actually you know has is the majority of of, of the cost in it. Huh. And it's kind of funny to to sit and watch um, new rocket companies um, really really focus in on like the bill of materials of the rocket and, you know, taking every dollar out of that. And sure, that's a great thing to do. But that's not where your costs really come from when you actually operate a launch vehicle. Well, I think that's something that you guys have a perspective on compared to other some of the other new players in the tables actually launching and operating vehicles. You know, that's that's something that your, your expertise will show through there, you know, as a, uh, putting efforts into uh, probably where it matters long term compared to, you know, the, the short term gain of uh, really worrying about each and every little bolt you know the cost of each mm, bolt mm. um so so that that brings up a good point though as far as operating a helicopter i think of that as very expensive you know and it is a helicopter is expensive but if you're saying yeah, it's, it's like much it's cheaper cheap compared it's to like a f- five it's like five thousand dollars an hour for an s92 which is like the, the bell 429 that we operate is like three thousand dollars an hour mm-hmm. um and in order to, to you know to get out to the um you know, to to the rendezvous point, it's like two and a half, three hours flight. So wow. it's it's like sixty to seventy thousand dollars for the ship just to sit in the port, not even <laughs> going anywhere, just to have the luxury of the ship sitting in the port. It's like sixty thousand dollars a day. So what? um and that, yep, and that's just a little ship. That's a tiny little ship. It's not like a you know, giant ship. Um, you would be stunned at how much it costs to um, to operate marine assets. 
No. Okay, I I am stunned to know how much it costs to operate. That's why we don't have a barge, because <laughs> it's just horrifically expensive. I, wow. Okay, touche. Uh, I, well, I know you love helicopters, but that's a... Uh, that's another another mark towards uh, goodness in helicopters, I guess. I had no idea. Um, okay, mm. so so I, I got to get back to that second stage and all that stuff too, because yep. um, so it's inside the payload fairing during ascent. Super cool. Uh, how is that going to work though? You know, you're still talking about human rating this and having this be something that could be you know uh, operating for human spaceflight. Uh, have mm. you? Ha- I guess how far are you into thinking about that or considering that when you have a, an encapsulated payload fairing like that? Well, so this is the thing for a capsule. The capsule is generally the fairing anyway, so you just remove the the actuated fairing halves or petals um, for for a crewed mission. So there, the, you know, the, there is there is no fairing requirement there. So um, the capsule becomes a fairing, and that's and the second stage is hung below, right at the line Correct. of where the payload fairing. Right, okay. right at the se- yeah, yeah. So if you look at the load, I mean, th- this 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 was all done on a whiteboard, um, and, and it's like an engineer's in a structural analyst dream because <laughs> if, if you actually draw out the load path you know you you have your payload and your job is to get the load from your payload into the tank walls that's that that's kind of a structural analyst job is in the most efficient way possible and you know when you when you're typically you know doing that um, through a traditional rocket then you get it out into the rocket tank walls and then you've got to push it through your second stage and then you got to, then you got to push it through your separation planes and down into your first stage and ultimately react it Whereas if you think of the concept with Neutron, uh, literally you know, your payload cone goes directly to the hard point of the fairing opening points, which is you know a structural hard point for the vehicle anyway. Uh, and then everything be- else below that is just sort of hung off that, that structural hard point. So it's an incredibly efficient way to trans- you know, transfer all those loads um, you know, ultimately into the tank walls in a really, really you know, short um, load path. Wow, yeah, that's, that's actually really cool when you think about it. Um, so I guess it, another question with those fairings and things like that is, uh, is there is there any chance that you know at subsonic speeds you could reopen those on on reentry and landing and use them <laughs> yeah. as drag brakes basically? Yeah. So that was the original plan. So we didn't have um, any of those kind of fins at the top, the canards at the top for any any kind of range uh, adjustment. And the, the original plan was to um, you know to open those fairing petals. That's why there's there's four of them. Um, and, mm. and try and do the cross range um, with that, but the loads just get insane. Like mm. the loads just get ridiculously insane um, so quickly, and uh, it does. It, you, you you fall off the trade very very quickly. Um, and you know the the design of the vehicle is such anyway that uh, you know it's 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 almost like a reentry capsule in it, in its in its design. Uh, you notice it's very wide at the base, yeah. and, and then you know narrowing up. Um, so that that does the majority of the work anyway, but we just couldn't get enough authority um, with the pedals to do you know cross range, and also we couldn't we, you know the, we couldn't really react the loads efficiency efficiently. Everything gets too big, mm. and especially probably at hypersonic speeds. I'm guessing the they're pretty well in the wake of the vehicle as well. It's probably hard to get any reasonable control out of them that way too. Yeah, yeah. They probably yeah. don't act well, like and a also, drag brake at that point. No, and, 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 and in those flow regimes, you know, you get all sorts of crazy shock shock interactions, and you know, mm-hmm. um, it, it fin is just so easy, right? It's so well understood, um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's it's a very very simple problem to solve. But when you've got these kind of, you know, funny shaped things dragging out in the wind and shock waves attaching to them all over, that just gets really really complicated to to analyze and, and make reliable. Mm. Now, have you already designed how to actuate and control those fins? Are those going to be electronic or electric? You know, electric motors or have you not quite gotten that far into design yet? You know, the, they'll be most likely electrohydraulic. Um, so we we do a lot. Obviously, um, we're very familiar with um, electric things. Mm-hmm. So um, electrohydraulic will be, be be most likely the solution. Very simple. Yes, very simple and very quick too. And those are good things for yeah. Um, what about uh, it's for reentry now? You know, with that kind mm-hmm. of blunt body design and everything, how it kind of folds in and all that stuff. Um, it is interesting that the, the legs do protrude in front of the the shock plane. So, will they? Ha- do you have to worry about their uh, their plumes? You know, their actual uh, their bow shock. Is that going to interact and make this spiky point right in the middle of the engines or something like that that you guys have to worry about? Yeah, I mean, um, there's 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 a lot going on down there as you kind of allude to, and um, you know, we, we'll do some more some some more CFD to to really try and understand. Um, that, but I mean, we have we have a lot of learnings from um, from Electron as well. I mean, it's it's a, it's a very simple blunt uh, bottom end, 
but um, you know, even on Electron, you, there's some really weird heating spots that, that you see um, you know, around and in between the nozzles, um, where, where you basically get stagnations um, you know, from the flow and, and get really, really hot spots. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the, actually the, the bigger challenge with the legs is not re-entry, it's actually ascent, because as you're, as you're ascending mm. and your plume's expanding, your legs get impinged by the plume. Yeah. Um, that's actually the dominate, dominant thermal case um, on ascent rather than actually re-entry. Really? Okay, yeah, that, that actually makes a, a really good point. Uh, but, and that you're, it looks like there is some amount of shock absorption kind of built into the, the ends of the legs there. Um, but yeah. the, I'm assuming the bottom of them will probably not be, you know, those have to be something high, like you said, high temperature, uh, mm. you know, and, and probably pretty strong. Or the very bottoms, will they still be carbon fiber or will those likely be some kind of metal? Yeah, I mean, um, so the, the, I guess the, the reacting structure will most likely be composite and will run a hot skin. Um, that, that's, um, you know, we, we can get really, really efficient um, interactions of the structures um, by making kind of a cold structure in structure carbon and then, you know, a hot skin either with, with thermal protection systems or even just, just, a, just a hot skin. Yeah, or yeah, but the but the whole the whole point of these legs. I mean, the way the design came about is we 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 started off with something that looked more like a rocket, um, and in kind of parallel in it, in its sense. And um, it's one of these things that sort of all happened in like twenty minutes. And um, you know, we, we're we're draw, drawing on the whiteboard, and um, and I was working on the legs at the time, and the legs were driving me insane because um, you know I just hate mechanisms. Mechanisms are just suck at the best of times, let alone. You know, um, when 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 you've got to you know build them super light and and um, and but anyway, it, it it was kind of driven out of that. It's just like, well, how can we avoid just not having legs? And it's like, well, let's make the base wide enough so we don't need legs. So we did a quick calc and it's like, yeah, we need about seven meters in the diameter of the base. And then um, and then what is what is the optimum um, shape from there on? And we ended up with kind of a traffic cone, or it looked very similar to like um, you know the Delta Clipper or DCX. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, that 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 traffic cone, that that single stage to orbit vehicle. It's like actually, um, that is the most efficient structure um, to transfer all the loads, and it's the most efficient, efficient structure. And then we did some some aero on it, and actually, it turns out that um, you know a cone like that is great for entry. There's plenty of examples of that, mm -hmm. and you know, help manage all of the thermal loads as we're descending. Having that, you know, decreasing diameter means that the pressure gradient across the vehicle is also decreasing, so you don't get shock waves attaching and and it all kind of made sense, you know, pretty pretty quickly. Um, so we, you know, somewhere there's there's a picture of, of of all of us standing around a whiteboard with a traffic cone. But um, <laughs> that ultimately, that's what it evolved into. And you don't have to worry about those legs. Uh, they they almost look like wing streaks on on two of the sides appear to go, you know, they are. pretty much yep. all the way up. So they are kind of streaks. You can use that a little bit as aerodynamic lifting. Uh, yeah. Yes. And cross range to get to get the yeah cross range and and, and down range get 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 that right to get the you know the right the right um, aero um, aero trajectories for that, that and, final. Timing. And that those lifting points aren't so. I mean, they look like you know if it's flying backwards, you know, engines first. It does appear mm -hmm. that the you know having the legs out already in front of it seems like a, a bit of a no no aerodynamically almost having them so far forward. But I assume. With the mass of all the engines right there, that your center of mass is quite far forward too, though. Oh, it's way back. Oh, especially with a lightweight carbon carbon structure, it's like mm, yeah. yeah, it's 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 way way you your know center way, of way lift down is way there. back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, way back. And and the thing is, because the structure is so light, um, you've got this wickedly awesome ballistic coefficient with no mass. So you know the reason why um, we're able to be really efficient with return to launch site um, is because we have like this really great ballistic coefficient with low mass, and mm. you know um, it's it's it, it's less like jumping off of the roof with an umbrella versus jumping off the roof, you know, holding a golf ball in your hands. It's it's <laughs> it, it makes it makes all of the difference, um, and it makes mu it much more efficient uh, to do that re you know return to launch site um, trajectory. You don't eat so much propellant. Yeah, so so you won't have to do as much of a, a boost back burn. You can kind of fall short of the of the landing pad essentially, and basically glide back more or less, almost to a degree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the boost back, yeah, the boost back. I mean, first, firstly, light mass is just a winner everywhere. Like I often talk about the spiral of doom for rockets, where you know you add you add a little bit of you know inert mass, and you've got to add. <clears throat> <coughs> excuse me, you've got to add more propellant and you have to add a little bit more inert mass and this just spirals away. 
Yeah. Well, if you can in- invert that spiral of doom, then it's all awesomeness. And a, a lightweight structure is kind of like that because if you have a super lightweight structure at the end of that burn, then you know the, the amount of the amount of you know delta v you need to impart to it, or the amount of energy you need to to impart to it to get that delta v is much much lower. So that's awesome. You win there. Um, versus you know having to to slow down a big heavy stage and then turn it around, and then mm-hmm. on reentry, um, you know you can use the atmosphere uh, to do a lot of the work for you, just like we do with with electron, because the ballistic coefficients in the right place, the the mass is so low, so the atmosphere and you can do it does a lot of work. The heating's not nearly as high, um, you know it all it, it's just all goodness. Like light structures, is just wonderful. It's just a win win all around. It's it is just yeah yeah. So just, are Takes all the pain out of propulsion, everything. Yeah. So are you not having to do uh, an, an entry burn or some kind of burn similar to electron? You can just do your boost back burn and let the atmosphere do the rest? Yep. So there's, there's one boost back burn and then one landing burn. That's it. Wow. So you're just going to let... Uh, that's Yeah, that again speaks to, uh, I'm assuming, you know, carbon composites. Uh, it's, it's amazing that you've got... I, I have to admit, it's pretty amazing that you've gotten away with it with, uh, with electron too, with... You know, with no active uh, aerodynamic control to just using cold gas thrusters to continue, or, you know, properly orient the stage. It's been amazing to see that it's been returning so, you know, so cleanly. That's That's been awesome. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it looks easier than it is. <laughs> I, <can't figure> <laughs> I, I can only imagine the amount of work that you guys have to do for that. Um, but yeah. I want to talk more about, uh, about Archimedes because... This is going mm. to be your first uh, first vehicle that's not either uh, you know just uh, pressure fed or electric pump fed. You're now looking at gas mm-hmm. generator. Uh, congratulations, I guess. I don't know if it's congratulations isn't calling up, but that's that's got to be kind of scary. Are you, are you worried at all about having to develop a, a gas generator engine for the first time? No, I mean it's 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 a gas generator. I mean, <laughs> I might I might have had a different if you if you said like we're going to run a full stage you know flow cycle then. Then, then now, now I'll be worried, but it's it's GG. Like I mean, yeah. it's it's it. You know, I mean, like the the pump side of of the equation is is no no different. Um, you know, we've got electric motors and electron running pumps, uh, but whether it's a turbine, you know, so the pump the pump heads and the the knowledge that it, it takes to to build good pumps is 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 already gained. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, uh, the GG cycle is 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 such a, a you know such a well understood and and an arbitrary simple cycle that um you know that it, and th- this is kind of the point is like where, where do you where, where do you put your your innovation and where do you put your expertise and if you have a lightweight structure then you don't need to push propulsion and that was kind of you know mm-hmm. the point um so you know archimedes is 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 a the boringest engine that we can build in a lot of sense <laughs> it's not we're not pushing the boundaries anywhere in that engine so um, you know, it's a GG Methalox, ho hum yeah. kind of an engine. Pretty, pretty conservative all around. Really. Yeah, yeah. And this, it sounds. But actually, me- go ahead. That's what you want, though, and that's what you want yeah. in a reusable launch vehicle. I mean, do you want to sit in a in a in a you know a seven eight seven or a, a just you know a jet and look out at the wing and look across at an engine that's like, like safety factor one point zero one. <laughs> or do you want to look out at that, you know, out on your wing at a safety factor of 1.5? So, right. th- and this is fundamentally what it comes down to. Like, it, a whole ro- a rocket is just a giant engineering compromise, and you just have to choose where you're going to eat the pain. Um, and you can choose it in propulsion, you can choose it in structures, you know, wh- wh- where is the bit that's, that's going to destroy your life? Hmm. <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it. And you guys are definitely, I mean... You, you've known how to do the carbon composites so well. Obviously, you've proven that that you're kind of the kings of the of the composites and of the structures. So, you know that like you keep saying that makes it so you don't have to do as much heavy lifting with the engines. You don't have to do as much yep. is making your lives easier on that end as well. So, it's, it mm. is interesting. Tom Mueller really wanted to do a methane Merlin. Uh, SpaceX propulsion yeah. engineer Tom Tom Mueller really wanted to yep. do a methane Merlin and. Um, it's fun to see that you guys have kind of come to what is similar to a, a methane Merlin, a, a similar class engine, uh, you know, gas generator. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be really fun to see because I think that that actually makes a lot of sense for your vehicle. Um, what's Yeah, yeah. And, and so as far as uh, other design decisions with that, I mean, have you looked at, obviously, yeah, you can't scale up uh, electric pump fed that much, you know, as you kind of mentioned in the video. It just doesn't close. 
Um, but had, had you even considered, had you considered close cycle at first or anything, or did you just pretty much go, this is, was it pretty obvious when you guys got into it? Oh, it's su super obvious. I mean, um, <clears throat> like I say, at the end of the day, this is about a reusable launch vehicle. And you need, in, in propulsion, you need, you need margins. You need structural and thermal margins. That's what you need. So, um, you know, pushing, pushing into any of the more exotic cycles, um, it, it just, you know, if, if we had to do, if we had to go there because we couldn't get the structures, you know, where we wanted them, then that, that's your only choice. Um, and I, I, look, I, I even spoke to Tom earlier this year and said, look, Tom, this is what we're going to build. And he's like, yes, that's exactly the right <laughs> thing to build. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, th this, is, this, is, this is about, uh, you know, a reusable workhorse. Um, and, and you just, you, you can't build something that's that's super reliable and super reusable when when you when you're pushing up against you know the margins of materials and and you know the, you know, the margins of everything really. Um, so from from a propulsion perspective, the key here is is you know just keeping all of the you know all of the all of the limits well within check and not trying to push the boundaries. Hmm. Yeah, I, that's. I like that. That uh, do you have like uh, do you already know things that even like the you know what type of injector you're using, how low it can throttle, and all that stuff, or is that all still kind of to be yeah, determined? Yeah. yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, you know, the methane is obviously a, a gas liquid injector, so you know, there's there's very very well understood kind of geometries that you you know that you want to run with those kinds of uh, you know kinds of phases of propellants. Um, and you know we'll we'll, um, we'll we'll leverage heavily on our three D printing. So um, you know the all the lessons we've learned with with three D printing, you know hundreds of Rutherfords. Um, you know the majority of that engine will be three D printed. Um, so there's there's, there's it, it's a different engine, but um, but really it's we, once you've built a few engines, it's it's all a bit the same. I mean <laughs> you, you get your thermal balance and then and then sort of you know single element injector testing and just sort of go from there. I mean it's not. Yeah, this is this feels very, very kind of turn the crank. So sorry, did I hear you say liquid liquid gas injector? Is is that because yeah, well, meth me methane will yeah, well, methane yeah will yeah. boil off in the in the active regen channels? Is that right? Correct. So yeah, it arrives yeah, in the combustion chambers as a gas. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I hadn't really. I didn't know for sure. You know, if if it boils off at that point or or not. I assumed it would, but. Um, yeah, so so obviously active regen, which is par for the course. Uh, but you, but is it going to be like a? Are you going to be doing uh, swirl injectors or uh, uh, you know shot with a traditional shower head like uh, impinged injectors or pintle? Or, or can you give us any of those details? Well, let, let, let's just say, I mean, if, if you if you if you had one gas and one liquid propellant, you know, th there is there's some obvious choices around injectors. Okay, you didn't tell me the. Uh, you didn't say what you did. Uh, when I want to ask about electronic go. It's a very good injector, <laughs> so I'm getting. It is a very good injector. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, Ru Rutherford is an amazing engine. Like the team, the team is is you know, that that is a, just such a high screaming you know, screaming performance engine. It's uh, it's quite incredible, really. And you know, it's it's not a copper lined engine either. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's it you know it's a pure 3D printed in canal engine. So mm -hmm. generally, as you shrink the engine, um, you know, throat cooling especially gets harder and harder mm -hmm. because you've you've got you know you've got tremendous amount of obviously heat flux but very small surface area to deal with it um so you know to have such a high performance engine um in all stainless steel and small is was it's a real credit to the team i guess let me ask you this then if you don't mind uh in that term as far as trying to cool like a throat of, of the rutherford do you do any mm. um any film cooling at the throat where you're have little no. holes nope. nothing no nope. nothing no nope. it can just handle I mean, the heat load yeah, I mean the the injector the injector geometry is is um, the team has spent a lot of time and a lot of work on that. They're little little nuggety little grunters those <laughs> engines. They're very they're very impressive. Is there is there some film cooling as far as additional uh, you know uh, fuel injectors around the outer perimeter of the injector face or something? Yeah, there's, there's you know most engines most engines will run some film cooling, so there's a small amount of film cooling. And in fact, if you look at um, well, you can, actually you can look at just about any um, any, any rocket engine on an upper stage on a like a, a refractory metal alloy nozzle, like a Nobium nozzle, you can see the dark spots. Um, so if you, you you'll notice it's kind of on a nozzle, there's this kind of dark spots r that run around the periphery. Well, those those are actually the uh, the you know the locations of the injectors up in the thrust chamber. Um, and that's where that that's where you can that, that's where the film cooling injector kind of lies is in line with one of those dark spots. Oh, I always thought that was from just the fins that kind of hold the the manifold. 
you know, the uh, I guess you don't have a but you don't have a, a gas turbine manifold on Electron because it doesn't have a, a turbine. No. Interesting. No. So that's just from the pockets basically of the film cooling. Yep. Is that okay? Yep. Is that I? I've, I'm so glad I have someone to ask this. Sorry, I'm working on it. I'm the reason I'm excited about cooling is I'm working on a, a video about you know why rocket engines don't melt because it is pretty amazing <laughs> yeah. to have yeah. you know that much heat yeah. contained within walls that should yeah. by all, all by all accounts it should melt the walls every time. Mm. Uh, so it's pretty amazing mm. that that you engineers get to figure out how to keep the engines from melting. Um, and it you know with the F1 engine having uh, such drastic film cooling, especially with like it's you know because it used the turbine, uh, oh, yeah the GG into the yep yep, yep and you yep. really see that distinct flame front below the nozzle exit you know you can see that mm. that dark thing but I even noticed yep. that you know with like the RD180 closed cycle, you know you can still see little spikes coming out from the bottom of the nozzle that are kind of those dark spots you know at sea level. Um, I couldn't mm. tell if those were a little bit of flow separation, you know, the, the flame getting pushed in, or if that would indeed be from some of the film cooling. Do you happen to know? I'd have to, I'd have to go and take a look at it. I'd have to have, have a look and, and have a look and see. Yeah, okay, I'm, not, send, I'm not that familiar with the. Yeah, I'll send you a, an image, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it because I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, that'd be I'd, I'd be very curious if that's if that is you know what type of film cooling or if that's or what exactly that yeah. is. But I, I'm yeah, if the, you don't the, mind, that's the inject. No, and, and the other, the other thing that plays into this is the injector pattern as well. So the injector mm -hmm. pattern can can make those those kind of shapes around around the periphery of the nozzle also. But oh, yeah. that's very cool. That's very cool. Okay, so uh, a few more things, if you if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds you know I'm guessing this whole vehicle will live its life basically vertical. It likely yes. You know will it uh, it will likely it, just stay vertical the whole time, right? Yeah, well, infrastructure sucks, remember. So yeah. anytime you've got to build something to break it over, then, you know, it's, it's a whole piece of machinery with a whole maintenance schedule and a whole team to maintain it and operate it and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, the concept here is is to, to not break it over. Um, and, of course, you know, structurally it, it kind of hurts breaking those things over. You've got to support them gently and all the rest of it. And um, so it's just it's just an operational and, you know, and, you know, OPEX nightmare. So if you can avoid doing all of that, then you're in a far better position. So how do you get it from? So you are you still planning? Because last time we had spoken, I think you had said you were planning to build most of these at Wallops. Actually, was your plan or at, something at, along at that? At the launch site. At, at the, the, launch at the site. designated launch site yet to be announced, but yes. Oh okay. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah, so uh, so so yes. Um, you know, the, the, we we remove that constraint immediately. That always seemed to me that to be the dumbest constraint you can imagine is like the diameter of the rocket is set by the lowest bridge between California and Florida. Um, right. That's not a good engineering trade to have and, you know, to have to deal with. So, um, so yeah, we, we, right from the very beginning of the program, we just released all constraints on diameter. So, so you'll, you'll build the rocket at the site, roll it out mm -hmm. vertically, uh, and, mm -hmm. and integrate, uh, assumingly integrate vertically, obviously, with the payload. Um, Correct. Yep. I'm guessing, you know, if you have a quick turnaround time, you ought to still bring that, bring the rocket back in. You know, to the to the payload integration for the, the facility, and then roll it back out. Is is that correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, that's not too bad, though. I mean, <laughs> that that's stuff's... that's the whole point, right? Is yeah. is the minimum amount of facilities and operations possible? Yeah. And you trade a lot for that, right? I mean, um, you know, just 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 a strong back, for example, not having a strong back in an umbilical tower means you have to run all of the upper stage filling lines up the length of the first stage, and it's all mass. You you, you know, you're eating mass all over the show. But um, but you know operationally, uh, it's it, it just makes huge huge you know huge gains operationally, um, and if you have super lightweight structures, then you can actually afford to trade in some some transfer pipes up the side of the vehicle to fuel the upper stage, mm -hmm. um, and all these kinds of things. Um, so as I mentioned, it's like it's a giant um, it's a giant kind of suboptimal engineering compromise. But mm -hmm. you know, giving yourself the the, the, the best set of constraints, um, you know, masses everything. So does that mean those streaks are? Did you did you kind of say that there's those are also raceways then of, of sorts? Correct. Yep. Hundred percent. Cool. Yep. One either one propeller on either side. Yep. yep. Oh wow. Bang on. And then then that yeah. So then that attaches. So the, the second stage has its own, uh, basically umbilicals that attach to the first stage, and you fuel it up through there. Correct. So in the inside huh. of the in, in the interstage, if you will, there's a vertical uh, a vertical umbilical between the first stage and the, and the second stage, and that's actually the you know the the, the umbilical breakaway um, for the upper stage. Huh. Wow. And okay. So I mean, these are all uh, you have a lot of new things that I don't think I, I've seen be used too often. 
Um, how are you feeling about your timeline? I know you're originally aiming for uh, uh, some kind of structure-ish next year, 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, engine hopefully firing by 2022. Um, and, uh, and still looking to maybe be flying by 2024. Does that seem like a reasonable timeline? Well, I mean, as reasonable as building any rocket is, is, yeah. is you know, is, I mean, look, I mean, we're, we're pushing super hard and well, look, there's new stuff, but that's, none of that's, none of that's like kind of risky or development heavy or challenging. Like if, if you stand back and you say, what are, what are the things that drive time in the development of a launch vehicle? It's always propulsion. Propulsion is always the last mm. thing to turn up at the launch pad, no matter what. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, if you can, if you can start off with a, a you know, a really simple well-trodden path of propulsion system and you know a development program that that that's not doing anything new there then that kind of solves half the problems oh. um you know just because we're running some internal umbilicals and bits and pieces is just no big deal um and a lot of the stuff that's in electron scales very very well to neutron so you know vent relief valves and all that sort of stuff whether it's two inches or 12 inches it just doesn't matter right oh. um and in some cases it's a lot easier to build um build build something bigger than smaller so mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so there's a lot of stuff. Avionics just ported across. There's a there's a bunch of stuff that that's kind of really long lead time, that's that's kind of done. But the one thing I will say in 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 the development of a neutron to date is, it is way easier. Now I'm probably going to live to regret this. So <laughs> maybe 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 let's not put a hat on this one. <laughs> but thus far, it is way easier to develop a larger launch vehicle than a smaller one, um, huh. because the the you like the the mass the mass constraints are just not not there. I mean, you know, we we really care an electron about ten grams. We really care about ten grams. Hmm. Neutron, I don't even care about ten kgs. So um, it's it's a totally different you know to, totally different um, you know situation to be in. Where is you know we we will we will debate with ourselves to add one pressure transducer on electron because it's a measurable impact to payload. Whereas, whereas with neutron, you're not even going to have that debate. You just put another one on there. So, there's a lot of a lot of things that on you know, a small launch vehicle that are just super super hard that on a large launch vehicle get get you know much much easier. Mm -hmm. And so, just to kind of wrap things up and round things up here, 2025, you know, that we're looking four years down the road. You're, you're predicting that obviously uh, constellations will continue to grow and be more mm. of a thing. So you're building kind of this constellation launch vehicle. Uh, how are you feeling? Like you know, by, by the time 25, 2025 comes around, do you think you'll be uh, pretty much in the sweet spot compared to the competition? You know, you're going to be still competing against Falcon Nine. New Glenn will likely be flying by mm -hmm. then. Uh, yeah, you, you must be feeling pretty good then that you're 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 kind of hitting the right place, at the right time, and everything. Well, I mean, put it this way: Bu building a rocket is is like you know that that is that you you can measure the amount of time that's going to take off your life. So there's no point in doing that unless that you, you think you can be competitive to what's there. Otherwise, you've just burned a hole in your life for no reason. So, um, so no, uh, we, we, we're, we're pretty confident. I mean, I think we've, we've been okay at picking the market niches to date, and, and we see, um, we see it a, real, a real opportunity in that, in that class. Um, you know, obviously, there's some very large launch vehicles that, that are, that, that are going to come online at some point in time. But fundamentally, you know, even if you have a super large capacity, it's kind of like Electron. Um, you know, Electron is flat out um, with with lifting customers um, that you know a lot of people would say, oh well, they will just go on rideshare. But rideshare doesn't actually you know meet their need and meet their meet the objectives of their business plan. So mm -hmm. you know, having having huge amount of capacity doesn't necessarily solve the problem. It's actually about getting the the right mass of payload to the right orbit in the right time frame that builds businesses. And um, ultimately, that's that's what we think Neutron's going to be very very successful at, and I'm sure um, you know we'll compete with with a bunch of others um, in the marketplace over time. Yeah. So I guess uh, it, it, I, you probably don't have any kind of pricing idea yet, or do you sort of have a, a price in mind of what a target you're trying to hit per launch? Yeah, we do. But um, like we like we say, um, you know, we would not even be undertaking this program if we didn't think that we're going to be very competitive on that element and you can you can stand back and you can look at look at the you know look at look at the design and look at the architecture and I've, as i said at the beginning of this it's like if if you if you want to draw a graph of what it costs to actually put something in orbit um, you know the cost of the rocket the bomb bit is relatively small compared to everything else and then if you look at uh, if you look at neutron like 
it's a flat pad. Like there, there, there's no <laughs> barge. There's like all, all of the things that 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 really add you know add significant cost um, just aren't even there. So um, so that, that's what that's what gives us gives us confidence that we think this is going to be um, you know a very unique vehicle in the marketplace. Well, as you mentioned too, even with you know Electron being overbooked already just even with you know mm. things that should be ride share missions uh how often you know rockets are almost never uh packed to the brim you know with their full capacity half you know no. most of the time they're flying well below their capacity um, Correct. so so eight you know eight tons and, is, and by the way you don't get a discount for that as a customer like whether right. you whether you whether you fill the rocket or you don't fill the rocket when you buy the rockets the cost is the same right exactly so if you have a cheaper ride period that's the, the bottom dollar, the, the, the amount of the check yeah. is, is what matters most to the customer at the end of the day. The, this, is, this is where the whole cost per kilogram metric falls over. It's a great mm -hmm. metric that, you know, that, that accountants and, and bankers can understand very easily. But the reality is that almost nobody buys a, buys like a, a rocket on a cost per kilogram basis. It is, yeah. how do I get this particular mass to this particular orbit in this time frame, time and what's frame. the lowest cost that I can do that for? Yes, that's and that's something that I think us, you know, armchair individuals, we just don't we, we love we also accountants and YouTubers, I guess, love the cost per kilogram <laughs> thing. But that is just not you're right. It's we, we don't see those behind the scene things. And it's sometimes confusing to see, you know, uh, a customer maybe choose a, a more expensive rocket or, you know, something like a proton or something like, well, why would you do that? But it's like, mm -hmm. well, if it's if it can get our payload into space a year earlier, you know, or whatever, the, all these other extra things that we just don't see at the end of the day, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, at, the, at the end of the day, it's it's total cost, mm -hmm. and total cost comes down to as well as is you know, if if I if I put my constellation in this particular orbit, it's much more cost effective of generating revenue, versus I'll take and this is where Electron is is you know does so well is that yeah I can go on a ride share, but I'm going to be in the suboptimal orbit and I'm not going to be able to generate as much revenue and the lifetime of my spacecraft is is you know is is much much shorter and it's going to take me much longer to generate revenue or I can pay a bit more on Electron and uh, and get to an optimum orbit um, means I can generate revenue faster the quality of the revenue is higher so you know this is how this is how satellite operators look at it as they look at it what is the total cost here not just a cost per kilogram to get my satellite in orbit. And that's what makes you different than me. <laughs> I love I love your expertise. It's really fun talking to you because I feel like you've you've gained a lot of knowledge having run Electron now. Uh, a lot of the operational costs and and how you do things efficiently and uh, and you know you just turned a, a rocket around and 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 your launch pad around and flew 21 days back to back. Uh, that's impressive. You know you're definitely getting that those gears moving. So it's been really exciting to see you guys do that. Uh, what do you, uh, I'll just wrap, round up here. What are you looking forward to next year the most? 2022. What's what's the thing that you that you have a big? Uh, uh, what are you most excited for? Well, I mean, it's it's qu quite ironic, really, because I used to travel to the U.S. every three weeks from New Zealand, and um, you know, it got to a point where it's a bit of a drudge. I haven't been to the U.S. for nearly two years, so the thing I'm looking forward to the most in 2022 is they're letting me out of this country. Is <laughs> I can get on a plane and come to the U.S. and actually visit, see the factory that we built there that I've never even been into, and uh, and and visit all of the you know the incredible uh, company and, and and people that we've um, that we've partnered with over over the last year or so. So actually, 2022 for me, I just can't wait to um, you know to, to get up to the states and 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 you know burn a whole bunch of time up there it's going to be great that's awesome that's good to hear well maybe i'll run into you then when you're when you're up stateside and i'll come say hi sounds good all right well peter Beck, thank you so much for taking time to, to chat with me and uh i'm really excited for what you guys are working on it sounds like it's going to be a really exciting couple of years here thanks tim yep no it's going to be a wild ride <laughs> all right thanks peter cheers Thanks again, Peter, and to the rest of the teams at Rocket Lab for allowing me that much time with Peter. I just love asking him deep questions because he has just really good answers. I really, really like hearing from him. Let me know if you guys have any questions or thoughts in the comments below. I'll try and answer some of the questions in the comments if I see them, but also be sure and stick around because I have a new video coming out about why rocket engines don't melt, and I think Hopefully you'll learn something from this one because I learned quite a bit doing the research for it. It's a super fun and interesting topic. I owe a big thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make everything we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you want to gain access to our exclusive Discord channel, some exclusive live streams, and early access to videos, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and head over to our web store where you can find merchandise like this, our awesome new 
space shuttle inspired hoodie. Now this is actually inspired by the first four space shuttle missions spacesuit. That was the S-1030A, which is the space shuttle ejection suit. And it was actually uh, based on the SR-71's flight suit. So I, I love this. It's, uh, it's got all these nerdy little details like what they had on the suit. You can find that as well as a lot of other fun stuff up at our website. But you'll also notice we have our new RD-171 long sleeve shirt and short sleeve shirt, as well as our RS-25 space shuttle main engine shirt and our R7 Soyuz shirt as well. You can find all of those and lots more at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.